Oh, I was going to say the same thing, Elijah. Maybe we'd better open the door and <laughs> let some warm air in. Oh, you better not. The snow will blow all over the place. Oh, why don't you see if there are any logs there? We'll build a fire. Uh, oh. Mother, I think my feet are froze. I can't feel them when I walk. Oh, I don't wonder after that climb up the mountain. Lord, I'll never forget this night. I'm about perished. Are there any logs there? Yep, plenty of them. I was going to build a fire when I was up here last week. Have been blazing in a minute now. I can find the door matches. I swear I put the box from in my pocket before I left the house. Oh, here they are. You better light a lamp first so you can see what you're doing. That's a good idea. Eleven o'clock. That's what it is, all right. 11 o'clock. Train's been over 20 minutes already. I suppose it's a storm that delays him. Train over a 10 minute walk up the mountain from the depot. Maybe the train's late on account of storm. No, I heard it signal on the crossing at Ascalon Junction a half hour ago. They'll be here before we know it. Now they're gonna find another lamp, will you there, Mother? Like at that fire. We should have gone to the depot to meet him. Oh, we should have done nothing of that kind. Telegram says to come here, open up the place, get it ready for him when he comes. Them's the instructions, and them's the only things I'll follow. It's instructions. But what do you suppose somebody wants to be doing in a summer hotel on the top of the mountain in the dead of winter? Mother, well, you know I can't figure out nothing. If I could, I'd been a multi millionaire years ago. Instead, I'm an old fool caretaker. And this little bit way in there, mother, make this place look a little respectable. What's his name again? Uh, McGee, I think the telegram says. McGee? Yeah. Hold on. Give Let me it, check. Give it to me. I, I want to read it myself. This whole thing is very mysterious to me. Well, of course it's mysterious. But it's none of our business. Mr. Bentley is the owner of the bull paid in. And if Mr. Bentley wants to permit some darn fool to come up here to be froze to death by stale air and be frightened to death by spooks, it's of his concern and not ours. There she goes. She's blazing up fine. I'll warm it up a little. My friend, William Howell McGee, will arrive at Ascalon Falls tonight on the 1040. He will occupy ball paint in, so be prepared to receive him there. And turn the key over to him and do whatever you can to make him comfortable. He has important work to do and has chosen ball paint for his workshop. Follow instructions, ask no questions. How about it? Sounds like them black cane notes are sitting to Richmond, don't they, Mother? Well, I can't understand it for the life of me. Mother! Yes? What if the fellas committed a crime in this? Coming here to hide. Do you think so, Elijah? I don't know. I'd say maybe. Well, if that's something, why should Mr. Bentley be interested in such a man? Well, I never thought of that. Well, whatever it is, it's none of our business. We mustn't mix in other people's affairs. 
Oh, Elijah. What? Do you think I'd better fix up one of them rooms? Well, you'll have to have a place to sleep. Here. This opens the linen closet. <clears throat> Open up the first room on the left. That's the one Mr. Bentley always takes when he comes. Oh, you better put another log on that fire. He'll probably be chilled to the bone by the time he climbs the mountain. Do you think he'll find his way along? Oh, he'll find his way all right. Station Angel will most likely direct him. Occupy Summer Hotel in the dead of winter. Beats all. Some will do.
once we get the sort of man to follow closely the light and frivolous literature of the day. Uh, how's that? You don't read the sort of novels that are sold by the town in the department stores. No. Nope. Well, I like those novels. The dickens you do! Wild, thrilling tales for the tired businessman's tired wife. Shots in the night, chases after fortunes, Cupid busy with his arrows all over the place. It's good fun, I like to do it, and there's money in it. You don't mean to tell me. No, oh, yes, considerable. Of course, they say I'm a cheating, melodramatic ranter. They say my thinking process is a scream. Perhaps they're right. Perhaps. Have you ever read The Scarlet Satchel? Never. That's one of mine. It is? I've come here to Baldpate to think, to get away from melodrama, if possible, to do a novel so fine and literary that Henry Cabot Lodge will come to me with tears in his eyes and beg me to join his bunch of stuff made mortals. And I'm going to do all this right here in this city. Sitting on this mountain, looking down on this little world, as Joe looked down from the limits. What do you think of that? Uh, maybe it's all for the best. Of late, I've been running short of material. I needed inspiration. A title gave me that. The lonesomest spot on earth, suggested by my very dear friend and your employer, Mr. Hal Bentley. What and where is the lonesomest spot on earth, I asked. A summer resort in winter, said he. He told me if Bob Payne dared me to come. I took the dare, and here I am. You're going to write a book? That's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to novelize Bob Payne. I'm here to get atmosphere. <laughs> we got plenty of that, all right. But when are you going to start in? Just as soon as I absorb my surroundings and make a few mental notes. You see, I do most of my work in the dead of night. I find I concentrate more readily from midnight on that I must have absolute solitude. The crackle of the fire, the roar of the wind, and the ticking of my watch will alone bear me company balking in. This all sounds very strange and weird, you, I suppose. How's that? I say you can't quite fathom me. Oh, uh... You're on your own accord, I take it. My dear Mr. Quimby, I'm here on a bet. On a bet? Exactly. I have here an explanation of the thing in Bentley's handwriting. Do you care to look it over yourself, or would you rather I read it to you? Go on and read it. I'd like to hear you talk. Well, then my personality has worked its way into your good graces. How's that? I mean to say I evidently appeal to you. Oh, I don't know if you particularly appeal to me. But, but what? Oh, I'd better not say. Come on, what's on your mind? Tell me. Well, to be honest with you, I can't figure out if you're a smart man or a damn fool. <laughs> Would you believe it, my dear sir? I've been stalled between those two opinions of myself for years. My publishers say I'm a smart man. My critics call me a damn fool. However, that's neither here nor there. This will perhaps clear away the cloud of mystery to some extent. Uh, perhaps Mrs. Quimby would like to hear this also. Will you call her? Oh, why, yes, of course. Mother! Mother! A mother! Yes, I'm all through up here. Um, you better come up, mister, and see if it satisfies you before you go. It's all right, Mrs. Quimby. I'll take your word for it that everything's all right. Come on down here, Mother. Uh, Mr. McGee's going to read you something. Is that so? Oh, I, I started fire, too, so the room should be comfortable enough to sleep in by the time you get ready to go to bed. Thank you. Sit down, Mother. What? Go on. See, I'm sitting. Mrs. McGee's going to tell us why he's here. Oh, is that so? Lord, I'd love to know. I've just explained to your husband that I'm an author. I do popular novels, and I'm here to write a story. A story of ball paint now, laid in this very hotel, perhaps in this identical room. And to complete this task within 24 hours, beginning at midnight tonight. You understand, Mother? He's going to write a book. You're going to write a book in 24 hours? That is the wager that was made between Mr. Benton and myself. He claimed it couldn't be done. I claimed it could. Five thousand dollars worth of his sporting blood boiled, and he dug for his fountain pen and checkbook. We covered the bets, and I placed the checks at the 44th Street Club. And he was to choose the godforsaken spot. He succeeded. I ran to my apartments, placed some manuscript paper, a dozen sandwiches in my slippers and suitcase, grabbed my faithful typewriter machine, just made the train, and here you see, ready to win or lose the weight, as the case may be. Well, what do you think of that, Mother? I have never heard of such a thing. Here's a copy of the agreement in which you'll notice your name is mentioned, Mr. Quimby. Listen. You are to leave New York City on the 455 for Askewan Falls, arriving at 1040, and go direct to Baldpate Inn, atop the Baldpate Mountain, where you will be met by my caretaker, Mr. Elijah Quimby 
who, after making you comfortable, will turn over to you the key to the inn. The only key in existence. Is that correct? It's the only one I know of. Oh, there ain't no other key. I can swear to that. Good. This will ensure you against interruption and give you the solitude necessary for concentration. You are to begin work at 12 o'clock Tuesday night and turn over to Mr. Elijah Quimby the completed manuscript of a 10,000 word story no later than 12 o'clock Wednesday night. You understand? You mean you're gonna hand it over to me? Precisely. <laughs> what do you think of that, brother? I've never heard of such a thing. There's Bentley's handwriting. There's a signature. See for yourself. So they never got the gang. 
I didn't read too much about it, though. That was over ten years ago. <laughs> yeah, you needn't be worried. You won't be disturbed here. Grafting politicians, reformers, hidden money. Sounds like a good sell. Is there anything more we can do for you, Mr. McGee? Oh, uh, no, thank you, Mrs. Quimby. It's all right, I think. Oh, yes, of course. You're forgetting something, Mr. Quimby. Forgot what? The key. Oh, oh Lord. Yes, the key. Uh, there it is. Now, you're positively certain that this key is the only key to ball pit in existence. It's the only one I know of. Oh, I can swear to it. Good. Well, what are you going to do? Lock yourself in? Precisely. Well, I, I don't mind staying here and keeping you company if you want me to. No, thank you. I much prefer to be alone. Lord, I'd rather it be you than me. I should think you'd be afraid of ghosts. Mother, I've told you 20 times there ain't no such thing. Oh, well, they've been seen here just the same. Ghosts? Oh, don't mind her, Mr. McGee. We think we know who the ghost is. It's a fellow up north here by the name of Peters. He's a hermit. A hermit? Yes, he's one of them fellas that's been disappointed in love. His wife went off with a traveling man. Came up here about four years ago. Lives in a shack a mile and a half north of here. <laughs> Calls it the Hermit's Cave. <laughs> All the summer quarters by a picture postcard from him. We figure he's the fellow that's been frightening people down in the valley. A waving a lantern from the mountainside with a white sheet wrapped around him. No one ever proved it was him. Oh, who else could it be? Ghosts, hermits, not bad at all. <laughs> well, Mother, I think Mr. McGee's anxious to get to work. Say good night, sir. Good night, and remember your phone call at 12 o'clock tomorrow night. I'll be here in a minute. Now I'm coming to see if you're still alive. Lord, I should think you'd be scared to death. <laughs> Mother, if you keep on like that, he will be. <sighs> well, good night. I don't envy your trip down the mountain on a night like this. Good night, Mr. McGee. Good night, Mrs. Swimby. And remember, keep a sharp lookout for ghosts and hermits. Lord, don't mind me, please.
say good morning. Why are you? I was just about to put that question to you. What are you doing here? I'm about to think I'm about to time for an explanation here. Did you follow me up that mountain? No, oh, no, I was here an hour ahead of you. How'd you get in here? Through that door. You lied. There's only one key to that door. And I have it right here in my pocket. My dear sir, I was laboring under that same impression until a moment ago. But if your key fits the lock and my key fits the lock, there are evidently two keys to ball pit instead of one. See? You told me that's a key to ball pit? Yes. That's why I became so interested in your arrival. I heard you telephone your friend just now and declare that your key was the only one in existence. It sort of handed me a laugh. You heard what I said over the phone? Every word. You don't think I got one to tell, do you? Have no fear on that score. I'm no tattletale, nor do I intend to pry into affairs that do not concern me. But I should like your answering me one question. Where did you get your key to ball, Paige? None of your damn business. I didn't come here to tell you the story of my life. Well, you might at least relate that portion of it that has led you to trespassing on a gentleman seeking seclusion. Trespassing, eh? Who's trespassing? You were off. My right here is in dispute. Who gave you that key? None of your damn business. If I remember rightly, that's the answer you gave me. You've got a pretty good nose to talk like that with a gun in front of your face. No, oh, that doesn't disturb me in the least. Well, I have never experienced this sort of thing in real life before. I've written so much of this melodramatic stuff and collected such splendid royalties from it all that it rather amuses me to discover that the so-called literary trash is the real thing after all. You may not believe it, old chap, but really, I've written you over and over again. <laughs> Say, I killed a man once at the laughing Hey, that's my line. I used it in the Lost Limousine. 400,000 copies. I'll bet you read it. You don't tell me who you are and what you're doing here. I'll kill you as dead as dawn here. Come on, I mean business. Who are you? Well, a name doesn't mean so much, so you may call me Mr. Smith. What are you? A writer of popular novels. What are you doing here? Trying to win a bet by completing a story within 24 hours. A few more interruptions of this sort, however, and it's plain to be seen all pain. You can do me a big favor, old man, by leaving me this place to myself for the night. I give you my word of honor that whatever I have seen or heard shall remain absolutely sacred. You must think I'm an awful fool to swallow that kind of talk. Very well, if you don't believe I'm who I say I am, and you doubt I'm here for the reason I gave, go upstairs into that room, and there you'll find a typewriter machine, several pages of manuscript scattered about the floor, and a letter on the oh, on the dr uh, uh, sorry, a letter on the desk from the owner of this inn to the caretaker, proving that all I have told you is the truth and nothing but the truth, and there you are. And you're not in it with the police? No. I wish I were, if the graph is as good as they say it is. So, you say you have a letter from the out of the end? Yes. Wait a minute and I'll get it for you. Back! What's the matter? I've been double-crossed before, young fella. I'll find it if it's there. Oh, very well. If you prefer to get it to yourself, why go right along? <laughs> you needn't be afraid. I never carried a gun in my life. But you keep one in your room, eh? If you think so, search the room. That's just what I'm gonna do. I guess I'll keep you in sight, though. Go on. I'll let you show me the way. If that's the way you feel about it, why certainly? Hold on, wait a minute. I'll peek around the room along first. You don't look good to me, you're too damn willing. If you don't trust me, go ahead. You went out here and I'll call you when I satisfied myself. You're not trying to bring something. Hello? I want to talk to the Askewan Police Headquarters. That's what I said, Police Headquarters. Who's there? What do you want? Don't shoot, I'm harmless. How did you get through that door? Unlocked it with the key, of course. My God. If you will allow me to bring my chaperone inside, I will explain in a moment who we are and why we're here. Your chaperone? Yes, another perfectly harmless female that's agreed to accompany me on this wild adventure. I have your permission. Say, what the deuce is this all about? You'll soon know. All right, Mrs. Rose. <laughs>
Well, Burris clone. But he forgot this when he took the jump. You needn't be afraid. I'm not going to shoot. At least not yet. Now when I ask why I am so honored by this midnight visit. I can explain in very few words. That will suit me immensely. My time is valuable. I'm losing thousands of dollars, perhaps, for even this waste of time. Be as brief as possible, please. Why do you stare at this? Do you believe in love at first sight? What do you mean? I've written about it a great many times, but I never really believed in it before. It's really remarkable. But you were going to explain your visit. Well, to begin with, I... Would you be kind enough to answer that phone, please? I don't care to turn my back on anything but a bolted door. If you please. Hello? Hold on a second, I'll check. Did you wish to speak to police headquarters? Police headquarters? Yes. But no, just say they must have made a mistake. Hello? No such call came from here. It must have been a mistake. That's all right. So you did call police headquarters? Yes. Why did you call police headquarters? Why did you call police headquarters? You know, these are the most remarkable lot of happenings. No sooner do I get rid of one bestseller than along comes another died in the wool to be continued in our next. You know, there's no particular reason for my saying this, but I really do believe I'd do anything in the world for you. I don't understand. But you were going to explain your presence here. Which I fully intend to do, but I should like to ask you one question first. Proceed. How did you get in here without a key? Oh, no, no, no. You know, I'm beginning to think that this whole thing is a frame-up. What do you mean? You have the only key to ball pit in existence, I suppose. So I understood. Well, if it's any news to you, ladies, believe me. There are more keys to ball pit than you'll find in a Steinway piano. Then <laughs> you lie. You lie. Remember your promise, Mary. Well? I can't tell you his name. Well, at least tell me your name. My name is Mary Norton. I teach special stores for the Ruben Star. In the newspaper game, eh? That's it. And this is Mrs. Rose, with whom I live in Reuton. She's the only other one that knows I'm here to do this story. What story? The story of the $5,000 wager you've made that you could write an entire novel in 24 hours. Who told you this? Remember your promise, Mary. You've made many a promise, haven't you, Mary? I should certainly like to know who gave you this information. I can tell you only that when the wager was made at the 44th Street Club this afternoon, a certain someone dispatched the news to me at once. Believing I had the only key to ball paid in existence, I hurried here to let you in, and lo and behold, you're already at work, as comfortable as you would be in a New York apartment. Well, now that you know my story, I'm going to throw myself on your mercy and ask that you let me stay here and beat. I shan't bother you in the least. Have you any objections? And you won't tell me who gave you the story. I can't. Nor where you got your key. Remember your promise, Mary. You know, I'm beginning to wish you hadn't brought her with you. What? No offense, Mrs. Rose. Of course I understand that Mary's a very promising young woman, but why continually remind her of the fact? That's just my little joke, excuse me. Let me get this clear. Your idea is to stop here and write the story of my 24-hour task. With your permission. Well, had you put it up to me half an hour ago, I should have said emphatically no. But since my little experience with a gun-flourishing, window-jumping gentleman, I'm inclined to entertain the idea of a companion or two. Who was the man with the gun? Why did he jump from the window? You might as well ask me why he placed a package of money in that safe, or why he telephoned the fact to someone else who is to pass the word along to Mayor Cargill. Mayor Cargill? What seems to be the trouble? Well, you see, Mrs. Rhodes is a widow, Mayor Cargill a widower. Perhaps you will understand why the name startled her when I tell you that Mrs. Rhodes is to become Mrs. Cargill next Sunday morning. Oh, indeed. Well, congratulations, Mrs. Rhodes. And again, I say I did not mean to offend. I'm not accusing Mayor Cargill of any transaction, dishonest or otherwise. I was merely trying to point out to you, ladies, that this has been a night of wild occurrences up to now. I've lost half an hour already, and as every minute means money to me right now, I'll have to make up for the time I've lost. Again, I apologize for any mistake I may have made, Mrs. Rhodes. I assure you are more honest than Jim Carvey never lived. I sincerely trust you're right, for your own sake. I hope the story proves well. I wish... What do you wish? Oh, nothing. I was just thinking of Sunday morning. Good night. Good night. I would gladly offer you ladies my room. But it's the only one cleaned and heated. And I must have some comfort for this kind of work. Good night. Good night.
Nice. Mary! <laughs> That's the sweetest name in the world. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. <laughs> night.
I can't understand it at all. You haven't anything on me. It's just about two more keys, and I'll pack up my paraphernalia, go back to New York, and never make another bed as long as I live. Will you please tell me your name? Well, the name doesn't mean so much, so you may call me Mr. Jones. And yours? My name is Liz. My husband is the president of the Askewan Route Suburban Railway Company. He's agreed to pay a vast amount of money for a certain city franchise, a franchise that the political crowd at Bruton has no power to grant. They're going to cheat him out of his money and use it to fight the opposition at the next election. If he sues for his money back, they're going to expose him for entering into a deal he knows to be nothing short of bribery. The present mayor is at the bottom of it all. I ran to my husband tonight and begged him not to enter into the deal. I warned him he was being cheated. He wouldn't believe me, but I know it's true. He's being cheated and will be charged with bribery besides. That's why I was the mountain on a night like this. I must have been followed, for I was shot at as I reached the top of Baldwin. Oh, I don't know who you are, but you're a man and you can help me. You will help me, won't you? Yes. What do you want me to do? In that safe, there's a package containing $200,000. $200,000? That's the amount. A man named Bland was supposed to deposit it here at midnight, and Carbon was to follow later and find it here. Carbon? Come in here? So they planned. I must have that money out of that safe before he arrives. You will help me, won't you? Don't you understand? My husband is being cheated, tricked, robbed, probably ruined. But I don't know the combination. No, oh, there must be something we can do. Who are these women? What are they doing here? Excuse me just a moment. Ladies, may I introduce you? Will you excuse me for a moment, ladies? Certainly. For God's sake, don't tell them who I am. My husband will kill me if he finds out I've been here on such an errand. I understand. You may trust me. I sympathize with you very deeply, madam, and I promise that no one shall take that money away from here tonight, unless it be yourself. And I'll get that money out of there about to blow the thing to smithereens. You give me your word as a gentleman? My word as a gentleman. Thank you. Ladies, may I introduce a girl schoolmate of mine, Miss Brown, who has become interested enough in my career to come to Ballpate to witness all endeavors to break all records as a speedy story writer. Up to now, I'm almost an hour behind myself. However, I expect to catch up with myself before the night is over. That is, provided there aren't over 300 more keys to the old front door. Now, might I have a word with you alone? I'd be delighted. I'd like to be alone with you forever. <laughs> Will you excuse me, please? Certainly. Go right upstairs, Miss Brown, and make yourself quite at home. Uh, Mrs. Rhodes, will you be good enough to show her to the room? I think she needs a little drop of something after that bitter cold trip up the mountain. You'll find a flask on the table. Well, I don't know what to say to all this kindness. Right this way, Miss, and I'll write where it is. I'll already try it. Thanks, Who did that woman claim to be? That's a secret I promised never to read you. But I heard everything she said. Then you know. I know she lied. She lied? She claimed to be the wife of Thomas Hayden, the president of the Suburban Railway Company. She lied. I've known Mrs. Hayden all my life, was brought up and went to school with her daughters. Mrs. Hayden is a woman in her fifties. As you can see, she was nothing more than a mere slip of a girl. There's a mystery going on here. Someone's playing a desperate game. Yes, and it's costing me $5,000. I'll never get my work done tonight. I can see that right now. But what do I do? I've met you. Are you going to give the money to that woman? Not if she lied. Could believe me. Let me tell you something, my old girl. I've written a lot of those Romeo speeches in my novels, though I never really thought this way before, but here goes. The moment you walked through that door and I laid eyes on you, I knew you were the one woman in the world for me. Why, there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. Try me. Very well. I shall. Give me that package of money before a carving comes to steal it. Help me get to Ruth without being molested, and I'll annihilate the graph machine with tomorrow's edition of the Star. With that money as proper evidence to turn over to the authorities, I'll wipe out the Cargan crowd and the streetcar trust with one swipe of a pen. And just think, I'll save Mrs. Rhodes from an alliance with a thief. Cargan's crook it always has been, but she won't believe me until I prove it. Great Scott, think of what a story I'll write. Think of what it'll do for me and the city of Ruth itself. 
You will help me, won't you? Yes, what do you want me to do? Isn't there any way to open this safe? I don't know. I don't know the combination and we haven't any time. But we must have that $200,000. What was that? Oh, that was nothing. It was just the wind creeping through the cracks, I fancy. Go upstairs. There's someone hiding in this room. Good night, Miss Norton. came near walking that time for fair. Who are you? How did you know there was money in that safe? What business do you have breaking into a man's safe in the middle of the night? Throw him in the cellar, Max. Go on, get out. Damn you, Cargan! I hate you! Oh, no, get out! Go on, get out! Oh, my God. In not a moment too soon, it would have been goodbye to the hermit if he ever got a hold of a roll like this. Two hundred one thousand dollar bills! Is it all there? I don't know. I'll see. You seem uh, surprised that I found the money here. What do you mean, surprised? Max, I'm going to tell you something. I didn't trust you today, and I don't trust you tonight. What do you mean you didn't trust me? I'll be frank with you. I thought you were going to try to double-cross me. I thought you were going to try to beat me to the bankroll through that woman Thornhill. Myra Thornhill? Oh, don't play dead. You knew she was around. You've been having secret meetings with her for the past 24 hours. That's right, Max. I had you followed. And I made up my mind to kill you if you ever tried to get your hands on that money. That's just what I'm going to do if you ever try to double-cross me again. Do you understand? Yes, I understand. Oh my god! I've been shot! No, you're not! I just put a bullet through that wall and I'll put one in you. Don't toss that pack of money over here. Come on, I mean business. You see, being a writer of sensational novels, I'm well up in this melodramatic stuff. <laughs> what did you do here? Max, you heard? Nah, I'm all right. Myra Thornhill. So, did try to double cross me, eh, you snake? I must insist on orderly conduct of the Nova House, please. Young man, be good enough to put that gun of yours on the table. Hurry, please. Now, kindly remove that gun from Mr. Cargan's pocket. I'm sure he has one, and put it on the table also. He might want to take a shot at you, and I'm giving you the necessary protection. Hurry, please! And now, Mrs. Rhodes, will you kindly ask the streetcar president's wife to step back into the room, then lock the door and remove the key? Thank you. And now, Miss Norton, will you kindly step down here and take those two revolvers from the table and place them in the hotel safe, then close the safe and turn the combination? Thanks very much. And now, gentlemen, I must insist that you step upstairs to the room on the right of the balcony. And Mrs. Rhodes, will you kindly step over there when these gentlemen are on the other side? I shan't keep you there long, gentlemen. I'll release you as soon as I've transacted some important business with this young lady. Lively now, gentlemen, lively. That's it, right in. Lock the door, Mrs. Rhodes, and bring the key down to me. That's the ticket. Thanks very much. Well, how's my work? Some roundup, wasn't it? I'm awfully sorry, for your sake, Mrs. Rhodes. It's good that you know now, isn't it, dear? I suppose so, dear. I suppose so. Well, now, here's a graph of money. Now what to do? Leave it to me. I've everything planned. What time is it? Uh, one thirty. But you can't get a train out of Ascalon until 5. Well, we can't sit around the station for three hours, dear. Try to get a taxi or whatever sort of conveyance they have in a darn town. But whatever you do, get out of Ascalon as fast as you can. Leave it to me. I'll find a way. Are you going to stay here? I'll have to. I want to keep guard on this crowd of lady and gentleman basins until I'm sure you're well on your way. Even though it's all night tonight and all day tomorrow. But your work. And never mind the work, I can write a novel any old time. So far as the best is concerned, I can lose all that and be repaid a million times over. I've met you. Good night, Mrs. Rhodes, and God bless you both. I wonder if 
for loving me. I live in root. For not. Crooked politicians, adventurous, safe robbed, love at first sight. And I wanted to get away from melodrama. And still they come. I beg pardon, who are you? I'm Mayor Cargan's butler. Mayor Cargan's butler? Yes, he's here. Do you wish to see him? Yes. Say to him that Mr. Hayden of the Root and Asquan Suburban Road is calling. I see. Are you the president of that road, sir? I most certainly am, sir. Your wife's here. What? Yes. Walk to that room right there. <laughs> Pardon me. I just wanted to see if you had a gun on you. Are you a crazy man, sir? No, oh, that's what the critics say. But I'm beginning to think they're all wrong. Sit down, Mr. Hayden. I'll tell the boys you're here. Boys? Mm -hmm. Come on out, boys. Everything's all right. The president's here. Lead on, boys. I'll walk a little behind. Hello, Hayden. What's the meaning of this, Cargan? I don't know. Ask him. Who's he? I don't know, and I don't care a damn. I'm disgusted with the whole works. We're nailed. That's all I know. Oh, no, you don't. You come back here. I'll keep an eye on you, too. You'd better sit down and join the boys, Harvey. I'd very much like to know the reasons for such strange accusations, young man. Your wife will be down in a minute. She'll probably tell you all about it. Confound it, sir. My wife is at home in bed. And that's what you think. You're not the first fellow to be fooled, you know. Here, Hermie. Take that key and open the first door to the left on the balcony and tell Mrs. Hayden that her husband is waiting for her downstairs right away. That's a good ghost. Go on. <laughs> Better make yourselves comfortable, boys. Well, I'll be running along. Oh, no, you don't. I'd like to have your wife meet you. I don't think she's ever had the pleasure. <laughs> what the devil sort of a man is this? Well, here's a novelty of us, a man without a key. Well, Bland, I have this key. I'll let him in. I have a dainty little key of my own. Oh. What's the matter, guy? I don't know. That's him! That's from what I told you about. You locked me in. Oh, hello, are you back again? I thought you jumped out of town. <laughs> Did you get all right? No, he's got it. What? Give me that one. Say, I killed men once for hollering at me. Ah, oh, here we are. Although I think you're getting the shade the best of it, Mr. Hayden, this young lady claims to be your wife. You claim what? Go on, holler your head off, Grandpa. It's music to my ears here, an old guy squawked. <laughs> what are you going to do with that money? I haven't got the money. It's on its way to Ruth. Miss Norton will see that it is placed in safe and proper hands directly she arrives at the office of the Luton Daily Star. The Daily Star? Huh. We're gone. <laughs> Where did Mrs. Rhodes go? Out of your life forever, Morgan. She's got your number. Sit down there. Sit down, Hermie. Sit down, Hayden. I don't care to sit down. Do as you're told. Sit down. Do you know that I'm the president of the Root and Asquan Suburban Company? I wouldn't care if you were the president of the National League. Sit down. <laughs> now, we're all going to stay right here until that phone bell rings. And I get word that Miss Norton is safe and sound in Root. That may mean three hours, or it may mean six hours. But we're all going to stay right here no matter how long it takes. So get comfortable and sit as easy as you can. You've got a long wait. You mark my words. I'm going to kill you for this. <laughs> I'm afraid I made a mistake in bringing you up here, Governor. You're always making mistakes, you damn blockheaded fool. I'm sorry I got you into this, Myra. Oh, Myra. I say I'm sorry I got you into this. Don't go to hell. <laughs> I hope you're all sent to prison for life! <laughs> this is going to be a nice, pleasant little party. I can see that right now.
Two o'clock. We've been sitting here over 20 minutes already. Say, Hermie, you'd better put another log on the fire. I think someone ought to say something. Come on, let's start a conversation. Things are getting awfully dull. This is all damn nonsense, and I refuse to stay here another minute. I'm very sorry to inconvenience you in this way, Mr. Hayden, but it's necessary that you should stay here and keep us company. So sit down before I shoot you down. That's a good little president. Now, let me see. What can we talk about to kill the monotony and keep things sort of lively? I had it. Let's all tell each other where we got our keys to Baldwin. What do you think of the idea? No? I'll start the ball rolling then. Perhaps we'll all fess up. I brought a letter from the owner of this inn to the caretaker, giving him instructions to turn the key over to me. That's how I got mine next. No? Big secret, eh? By George, that's funny. Let's see, how many keys are there? I am the first, Blaine the second, Miss Norton the third, our friend the ghost the fourth, this young lady the fifth, and if I'm not mistaken, you had the sixth key, Mr. Cardin. Hayden doesn't count, he had Blaine's key. Six keys to all things so far. I wonder if there are any more. There are seven keys to bald paint. Seven? How do you know? The old man told me so the day before he died. Mine's the original. Everyone else's is just imitation. Seven keys, eh? More company expected? More melodrama, I suppose. Where'd you get your key, Brad? None of your damn business. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> How about you, Cardin? Perhaps you'll be good enough to throw some light on the key subject. Where'd you get yours? I wouldn't tell you if my life was at stake. Well, perhaps the young lady will be good enough to inform me where her key came from. Well, I've no objections. Myra, please. He gave the key to me. And where did you get your key to Bald Pate? I can't tell you, Mr. Mayor. I've sworn never. I suppose he also gave you the combination of the same. He did. Myra! Oh, shut up. You never were anything but a crybaby. You got me into a pretty mess. Do you really think I'm going to sit here like a fool and not pay back when I've got the chance to do it? I'll tell you the whole scheme. I was to come here and make off with the package, and Carter was just to follow later and find it gone. We were to meet tomorrow and divide the money equally. You rat! His excuse to Carmen for the disappearance of the money is going to be to blame Bland and never having put it there. What? Sit down, Bland! Did you hear that, Governor? I was going to accuse me of stealing the money. You mark my words. I'm going to kill you for this. <laughs> <laughs> and where did you get that key to ball pay, Carmen? I thought you couldn't get in here unless I met you and unlocked the door. I can explain that. He was to meet you here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, am I right? That's right. I made the appointment on the phone. Well, the plan was to steal in here in the dead of night and take the money. He fully intended to keep his appointment here with you tomorrow morning, however, and appeared just as surprised as you would have been when you discovered the safe empty and the package gone. In other words, he was going to cost not only you, but Hayden and everyone else connected with the bribe. He tried to cross you, and Lou Max tried to double-cross him. <laughs> If I hadn't been interrupted by our friend here, I would have gotten the money and triple cost the whole outfit. What? Who is this woman? I don't know. <laughs> her name is Thornhill. And her oath isn't worth a nickel. Don't believe a word she says, Hayden. She's a professional blackmailer, pure and simple. Is this true? Well, I never heard of a pure and simple blackmailer, have you? And as far as my word is concerned, I fancy it will carry just as much weight as that of a crooked politician and his man Friday, whom he knows to be an ex-convict. What? Hold on, Maxie, it's just getting good. <laughs> Fine people you've introduced me to, you lunk-headed idiot. Well, what are you blaming me for? You wanted the deal, Pumpkin, didn't you? After this, you're doing your own cricket work. I'm not anxious enough to get mixed up in a thing of this kind. You've got pretty good enough to go after me, though. How dare you speak to your employer in such a manner? Oh, shut up! What do you think? I care for this job? I told you to stay out of the deal. That I was wrong. Now I'm well enough, you're only cheating the city of Bruton out of its rights. 
if this thing ever comes to light, we're all lucky if we don't spend five to six years in Estonia. If this thing ever comes to a showdown, I'll make a clean breast of the whole thing. I don't care who I send away, so as long as I can save myself. You know you think you gave me in a fix like this. You keep my mouth shut, no sir! I'm gonna tell the truth. I don't care who that suffers, so as long as I get away. One of our best little squealers. Well, you squealed, didn't you? Sure, I'm with you. Now I'm gonna scream my head off all over the place. Sir, sure. tried to double cross me, eh? Certainly I tried to cross you. You're around crossing everybody, ain't you? I've stood for your loud talk long enough, Harvey. I'm gonna get even for that punch you took of me to hear. Now you shoot any more of that killing stuff of me, and I'll come at you like a wild bear. You're never gonna kill anyone. You haven't got the nerve, but I have. And the next bluff you make of me will be your last. It's your fault I'm mixed up in this affair, and the best thing you can do is to get me away clean, do you understand? And you, you really think you were going to get the company for 200000 Well, I, this man would have led you for half a million before he let you have it, and held you up for hush money besides. I know what I'm talking about. He was going to rob you, Hayden. I dare him to call me a liar. Is it true you were going to rob me of the money, Cargan? Oh, I certainly. <laughs> Just what I was going to do. <laughs> rob you. But after all, it's nothing less than what you deserve. Isn't that what you try to do? Rob the city. If I'm a crook, is it not men like you who made me so? Forcing good people to lie and cheat and steal and filling the prisons with the poor devils who do your dirty work? You're worse than a crook. You're a maker of crooks. But Hayden, I swear to you, if I go up for this, you're going up with me. Even if I have to lie over a Bible and swear your life away. Hell of a gall you have to talk about being robbed, you do. I hope the prison catches fire and you all burn to a crisp. <laughs> you know, my suggestion was to start a conversation, not a rust house. The woman who took the money, who is she? A newspaper reporter. On the Daily Star. That sheet's fought me ever since I've been in office. They've got me this time. Sure. How much longer are you going to keep us here? That's for the telephone to decide. I'll release you as soon as I'm sure Miss Norton is safe and sound in route. The next train to route is not till 5 o'clock, so we must stay here till 6, eh? I'm afraid so. It means several hours of the best. So you might as well be patient. You've got a long wait. Well, me for my beauty sleep. She couldn't have made it that fast. It's over an hour by automobile. Answer that phone, please, Miss Thornhill. I'm going to keep looking straight ahead of me tonight. Take the message and repeat it to me as you get it. I'll tell you what to say if it requires an answer. Hello. Yes, Vault Hayden. Yes, I know who you mean. Just a moment. Someone wants to talk to you. Get their name. Hello. Your name, please. No. Yes. Very well, I'll tell him. Miss North. Tell her that it is impossible for me to turn my back long enough to come to the phone, and that you will take the message and repeat it to me as you get it. It is impossible for him to turn his back on and to the phone right now or to give me the message and I am to repeat it to him as I get it. You're at the commercial house in Ascawan. You missed the package of money five minutes ago. You either dropped it in the inn before you left or else lost it while hurrying down the mountain. Search the inn thoroughly. Ask him whether or not you should notify the police. You're nearly crazy and have no idea which way to turn. <laughs> Just a moment. Well, what shall I say? Say to hold the wire. Hold the wire, please. The money lost! Thank God, there goes their evidence. Who ever heard of losing $200,000? Can't be that outside Wall Street, that's for sure. You're a quick thinker, Miss Thornhill. What do you mean? Then I don't believe you got that message at all. Very well. She's on the phone. See for yourself. <laughs> My name's not Henry. It's Peter. Well, whatever it is, come here. I know you don't like anybody in this room any better than I do, so I'm going to take a chance on you. Take this gun and guard that door until I get this message, and you kill the first man or woman that makes a move. Do you understand? I'd like to kill them all. Don't shoot us. <laughs> Hello? Damn you, cock, and I've got you at last!
in the room where they put us, Max. And lock the door. They can make you get away from the window of talking. There's no window in that room. It's a linen closet. Get in there. What's the idea, Courtney? Oh, you never mind that. I'm school teacher now. All right, Miss Cardo. I want you to get on that floor. Tell that woman not to notify the police. And that she should return here at once. See what she says. Hello. <laughs> Why, the message is that you are not to notify the police of the loss. Return here at once and say nothing to no one. That is the message. Goodbye. All right. As quick as she can get here, she says. What are you going to do, Corgan? Oh, you never mind that. I'm running things now. Get it. You harm that girl, and I'll get you if it's the last act of my life. I've read that kind of talk in books. I write books of that kind, but <laughs> I talk in real talk now. Go on, get in there. Get in there. Now what's the move, Cargan? We're going to get that money if she's got enough. You don't think she's fool enough to bring it with us? She's trying to get away with it. Do you? What are you going to do with it if you find enough? Keep it, of course. Why, it's my money. Oh, don't worry, our giving holds good. Your people will get franchised. Why, you just openly declared you were going to rob me of the money. Oh, yes. Well, you see, I was crazy back there. I was mad clean through. I was being accused of left and right. It doesn't matter what I said, hey? I don't even remember the words. <laughs> what do you think, Flan? Don't ask me. You bought me out once tonight, and that's enough. I haven't forgotten what you said to me, Mr. Max. Good. I don't want you to forget it. I want you to remember it all of your life. Why, I wouldn't care if you had six guns on you. You're nothing but a cheap coward, Cardin. And you. <coughs> you tried to double-cross me, eh? Why, certainly. Who are you? Why, damn you, I... Hold on, wait a minute. You want some of it, too? Max, not while I'm around. Now behave yourself. The same speech you just made to Cag and goes for me. If one of you cut out this wild talk, I'm not going to take any more of it. I'll put one on your back and make another bluff at you. Gentlemen, gentlemen, please. You keep out of this, Hayden. You'll get all you're looking for if you don't. Uh, put it down, put it down, do you hear me? What do you mean by raising your hand at me for? Why, for two pins, I'd take you and wipe the floor with you. Could take a whole army of cowards like you. Now get away from me before I knock you down. Now, madam, what do you mean by claiming to be my wife? Now listen here, old man. You can scare these three little boys, but I don't want you to annoy me because I've got a nasty temper. Now go on, get away before I lose it. Max! Get away from that safe. Oh, you needn't be afraid. Only I... <laughs> Max, what's the matter if you go crazy? <laughs> now we're in for it, is she hurt? Put up the lights. What's wrong down there? What's happening? Yeah, everything's all right. N -n -n nothing's wrong. I know better. Open this door. Well, come here. Give me a hand. We'll get out of here. Where do you mean, Blanche? Open that one. Come on, hurry up. But I didn't mean it, I told you. It was an accident. Shut up. Do you want the world to hear you? What's wrong? What's happening? She, she, she's uh, fainted, that's all. Where are you taking? You'll keep out of this young fellow if you know what's good for you. <coughs> Who fired that pistol shot? It was an accident. Shut up. See here, Hayden, if there's anything wrong here, you can't afford to fix up in it. You're too big a man. But I didn't mean to kill her. It was an accident. Oh, we have a murder case on our hands. Is that the idea? I don't know, but whatever it is, we're in this thing together. We must frame a story and stick to it, do you understand? No, I don't understand. We must claim suicide. <laughs> That's it. She killed herself. I was an eyewitness. She killed herself. Do you think I'd enter into such a dastardly scheme? No. Then it's murder, there's the murder, <coughs> self-confessed. But you're all as guilty as this man here, every one of you. It's the outcome in rotten politics and greed. I'll swear to every word that's been uttered here tonight. I've had my ear against that crack of the door for the last five minutes. You can't crawl out of it, gentlemen, with your suicide alibi. It's murder in the first degree. And I'm going to help make you pay the penalty. I'm afraid you're in the wrong there. Oh, young fellow, I'm sorry. I pity you, I truly do. She's dead. You killed her right. Better plead insanity, old man. It's the only chance you've got. Bad business is carrying guns. Who was the woman? Your wife? No, no, gentlemen, you can't get away with it. It's good melodrama, but it's old stuff. I know every trick of the trade. I've written it by the yard. You can't intimidate me. I won't be third degree. 
You work very well together, but it's rough work, and it won't get you anything. Besides, you forget I have a witness, and Peter's the hurt. Where is he? You, get him. Bring him down here. Gone! Gone? Where? I don't know. He probably knows the place better than we do. You know, I saw you when you fired. You shot to kill. I tried to knock the gun from your hand, but I was too late. I didn't see the shooting myself, but I turned just in time to catch you before you got away. But you shouldn't have choked her. That was the <laughs> brutal part of it. Why'd you talk? Who is there? Open the door. In the name of the law. Please keep quiet. I think you better let him in. I'll unlock the door. I'll go. You don't know, I'll attend to that. Here. Wait a minute. I'll take that key. I'll take that gun I just saw you stick in your pocket, too. What authority have you? Close your trap! I'm Chief Kennedy of the Asquamon Falls Police Headquarters. That's my authority. It's all right, Chief. He's all right. Where's the light switch? Up there to your left. Hello, Mr. Mayor. What are you doing here? I can explain all that. That man has a gun on him also. Who are you? I'll tell you who I am at the proper time and place. You better get on your job quick here, Chief. There's something doing. Two of these men are carrying weapons, and two of them also have keys to that door. I'm telling you this to prevent a getaway. What are you trying to do? Run the police department? This is an important case, Chief. Thousands of dollars are involved in a crime committed besides. I advise placing every man in this room under arrest to me. What's this all about, Mr. Mayor? He's for flushing, Chief. He's just stalling for a chance to break away. Yeah, I got men outside. Nobody's going anywhere. Lou Max, eh? You got a gun? What are you telling this for, Max? He's clean. I'm sorry to inconvenience you, Mr. Mayor, but you're gonna have to relieve you of that hardware. And the key too, please? I came here to investigate. I gotta do my duty. There's nothing on me. Who's got the other key? He said there were two. This gentleman. Hello, Mr. Hayden. It really is quite a highbrow affair, isn't it? Well, come on, somebody open up. What's a big gathering about? That man has a key, too. Make him give it up. Come on. You got anything more you want to say? I prefer to tell my story in the presence of witnesses. I still insist upon the immediate arrest of everyone here. Myself included. Don't mind him, Chief. He's a madman. Somebody telephoned police headquarters from here about two hours ago. When we got on the wire, Central said they'd hung up. When we got a new connection, we asked if they called. Some woman said, no, it must have been a mistake. Well, we got to thinking it over at headquarters and it didn't listen good. So we traced the call, found out it came from up here at Bald Pit Inn. So I made up my mind to come up here and investigate. Now, ten minutes ago when I started up the mountain, the lights were all on, full blast. Then all of a sudden they went out. There was a gunshot, too. Every one of my men heard it, and we all agreed. It came from this direction. Now I'm just wondering, what's it all about? <laughs> Twas I who called the police headquarters. You? The sergeant said it was a woman's voice on the wire. That was the second time you called up, but I tried to get to you first. What for? I don't intend to tell my story until I'm in Europe. I charge these men with conspiracy and murder. gone mad, I suppose. He killed a woman a few minutes ago, and ever since then he's been trying to accuse everyone here of the crime. Murder, eh? Cold-blooded murder. So, who was the woman you killed? No, no, don't let these men get away with this, Chief. I can prove my innocence. There's the real murderer. These men know it as well as I do. They're accusing me in an attempt to save their own necks. They're afraid to tell the truth because this man is a squealer, and they know that a confession from him of a scheme to steal the right of way for a streetcar franchise in Rupin will send them all to the state penitentiary. I can prove why I'm here tonight. Ask these men their reason, and let's hear what they have to say. He's been raving like that for the last ten minutes, Chief. What is your reason for being here? I came here to write a book. You're right. He's a lunatic. <laughs> sure. Who was the woman that telephoned police headquarters? Mary Norton of the Rupin Star. The Rupin Star, right? Eh? She the woman that was killed? No, her name is Thornton. 
Where is she? In one of the rooms upstairs. Is there anybody else here besides you people? Yes! Peter, it's the hermit. Another crazy man, eh? Money's disappeared. Hey, it won't go far. I got the place surrounded. I'll have to look over the grounds before I send for the coroner. Won't get it until about 7 or 8 o'clock. And we'll have to stay put till he comes. Alright, where is she? I'll show you, Chief. Take my tip. Don't try and break away, young fellow. One of those cops outside? Blow your head off if you do. You needn't be afraid. I'm gonna stay right here. And I'm gonna make sure these other men do it till we're all taken into custody. Sad case, Chief. We're used to that. They generally go out of their minds after they shoot. Where is she? In here, Chief. to the cellar. What? I heard them accuse you of the crime. They'll never find the secret passage. They'll never find the body. What is it for that for you, damn fool? What do you make of it, Carter? The damn place is haunted. She must have escaped by the window. How could a dead woman jump for a window? Besides, the windows are closed. Say, what are you people trying to do? String me? You know I was born and brought up in New York City, even if I do live in Ascalon Falls. Can't understand it at all. She was in that room ten minutes ago, Chief. I'll take us home oath to that. My God, I'm going insane. What the devil is this all about? I won't be strung, I won't stand for it. Now what's the answer? It's no joke, Chief. There has been a murder committed here. Then where's the victim? In the cellar. What? In the cellar? If I'm not mistaken, that's where she was taken after the murder. He lied. You know she was taken to that room. You saw us carry her out there. Of course he did. What are you trying to do? Try me in the cellar? I tell you, Chief, you'll find the victim in the cellar. Then you can judge for yourself if I'm as crazy as these men claim to be, or whether they've suddenly gone mad themselves. Well, I'll get to the bottom of this thing pretty quick. <laughs> yes, Chief. Oh. Search the cellar of this place. Report to me here where you find it. Every nook and corner. Don't leave a thing unturned. Understand? Yes, Chief. Well, hurry up then! Yes, Chief! <laughs> yes, Chief! <laughs> if this thing turns out to be a practical joke, you'll all land in jail for it. I won't be made the laughing stock of Ascalon Falls, I'll tell you that! Hello? Who's this? Miss Norton! I'll take that key, please. Why are the police here? It's all right, don't worry. Who is this woman? She wants to be a newspaper reporter. She's a thief. She stole a package of money. Whose money? My money. No, my money. It's bribe money, Chief. Where is the money? The money's been lost. What? What are you people trying to know to me? Where is the money? Where did you lose it? Somewhere between here and Ascalon. I've looked everywhere, but it's gone, I'm afraid. Where's Mrs. Rhodes? She's at the commercial house in Ascalon. She was too hysterical to return. How much money was it? $200,000. Come on, cut out the kid and stuff. How much was it? That's the exact amount the package contained, Chief. $200,000. Where'd you get this money? I gave it to her. Where'd you get it? From Mayor Cargan. Where'd you get the money, Mr. Cargan? He took the money from that safe. How'd you open the safe, Mr. Cargan? I didn't open the safe. Who did? Peters, the hermit. Who put the money in the safe? Flake, that man to your left. Where'd you get the money to put in the safe? From Mr. Hayden. Is this true, Mr. Hayden? I refuse to answer for fear of incriminating myself. <laughs> What do you know about this, Max? I don't know anything. Don't ask me. Hayden gives the money to Blaine. Blaine puts the money in the safe. Peters opens the safe. Cargan takes the money from Peters. This buddy takes the money from Cargan, gives it to the newspaper reporter. She loses it in the mountains. Then somebody kills a woman, and the body just gets up and disappears. And you expect me to believe this bunk, do you? What does he mean to say somebody killed a woman? It's all right. Don't worry. Come on. Come on. Go on. Get in there. This is all we can find in the cellar, Chief. No nope. dead bodies or packages of money? Nothing else, Chief. So it's you, is it, Peters? Is that where you hide out? Cellar or both, Pete? We'll have a nice room in the county jail tomorrow. Damn the police! I hate that! <laughs> Grab the outside of this place. Yes, Chief. Yes, Chief. <laughs> You'll have to step upstairs, miss. I got a lot to say to these men, and I'm not particular about my language when I'm on a case. I don't believe this woman lost the money, Chief. I'll get the matron of the county jail here. Have a search. She got anything on her? You get it. So go on, step up in one of those rooms till I call you. Who's the woman that's 
girl says she left at the commercial house? Mrs. Rhodes. She's all right. How do we know? Maybe the Lord can see. That's enough. I'll call up the commercial house, see if she's still there. Hello? Give me 35 Central. Quick. Bring me when you get it. What's the name again? Mrs. Rhodes! Ah! She's dead! She's dead! What? The woman in that room! What did you do? Bring her back to that room? Isn't that what you wanted me to do? No, you played on an idiot! Tell me who did this! How did it happen? Don't worry, it's all right. Just take it easy. Downstairs where you belong. Nobody touched that phone. I'll answer it. This dumb monitor is the joke on me. Soon to find out. Hello? Yes, I called. Say, listen, Charlie. This is the chief talking. Is there a woman there by the name of Rhodes? She was. Did, eh? Not how long ago. See? Wait, what's that? She left a package there. Where have you got it? In the safe? All right, Charlie, call the department. Get a messenger down there, give him that package. Tell him to bring it up to Bald Pate Inn as quick as he can, understand? Never mind, just listen. Tell him to guard the garage and the depot. Put under arrest all strangers, men and women. Just do as I tell you, all right? And send the coroner up to Bald Pate Inn as quick as he can, understand? I got a case for him. Now keep your mouth shut and get busy. <coughs> she left the commercial house about a quarter of an hour ago. Left the package in the hotel safe. Somebody kills a woman, the body disappears and then reappears? That's pretty good stuff. How do you account for this? She must have stolen the money from me when we were running down the mountain. They got something! Well, what is it? A woman, Chief! <laughs> Shoot her in! Yes, Chief! I'm trying to find out. Is there any trace of the money? Are you going to have these women searched, Chief? Yeah, maybe it won't be necessary. We'll wait till we find out what's in that package she left at the commercial house. Now you know. I got the place surrounded. Nobody's leaving here until I clear this whole thing up and find out who killed that woman. Killed a woman? What does he mean? You stole the money from me, didn't you? I'll never trust another woman as long as I live. <laughs> <laughs> They're no good. <laughs> they never were. Shut up. What do you got to say, Mrs.? Yes. I did steal the money, but I did it for you, Jim Kyle. I knew that if the story was ever made public, you would be a ruined man. I knew that the evidence of money and the package would be the evidence to convict you. I knew. I intended to return it to Mr. Hayden and try and kill off the bride and save you from disgrace. I did all this because I thought you cared, and now you stand here ready to turn against me, to condemn me. Well, now I'll turn. Officer, these men have bargained to cheat the city of Bruton, and I demand their arrest on charge of conspiracy. It's a lie. It's the truth, Chief, the absolute truth. This young lady and I will testify and prove these men guilty of conspiracy and murder. Murder. What do you got to say to this, Mr. Cargan? Nothing at all. I'm through. <laughs> Me too. It was I who killed that woman. I shot her down like a dog, and I know I haven't got a chance. I know they'll send me to the chair, but I'll do anything. I'll turn state's evidence. I'll confess. Just please don't let them kill me. Come on, get up. Look the way these young fellow. There we go. Now what are we going to do, Cargan? No, it's for 10 years, I'm afraid. Go oh, on, get over there. Can you ever forgive me, Mary? I didn't understand, but I do now. And you came here to write a book, eh? That was the original idea. <laughs> no, I don't know yet whether you people are kidding me or not. <laughs> they got something. Well, what now? Chief. <laughs> now, tell the messenger to hurry back. Tell the coroner to hurry up. Yes, Chief. <laughs> yes. You know, if this thing turns out to be a bunch of cigar coupons, I'm gonna smash somebody's shirt. I won't stand to be strong, even if I am a small town cop. Great Scott. How much did you say was in here? Two hundred thousand dollars. I'll take that oh, money, Chief. It belongs to me. You hold that money, Chief. It's the only evidence of bribery we've got. Get away! You needn't tell me what to do. I know my business. Hello? Give me 13 
Central. Hello, Jane. Is that you? Yeah, this is the chief talking. I want to talk to my wife. Hello, Betty? Listen, get some things together and get the kids ready. Take that 5 o'clock train to New York City. <laughs> Don't ask any questions now, just listen. Once you get there, look up the railroads and take the first and quickest train to Montreal. Montreal! I'll be waiting there for you Thursday. What are we gonna do there? We're gonna live there! Mon tree all oh! I don't know. How the hell do you spell Montreal? <laughs> Listen, just go to Canada. Any part of it, I'll find you. Never mind the furniture, we're gonna live in a palace. Canada, that's all. Now you do as I tell you. What do you think you're gonna do? You heard me, didn't you? I'm going to Canada. Canada! I hope to God you freeze to death! <laughs> you mean you're gonna steal that money? Why shouldn't I steal it from a gang of crooks like you? It's the one chance in a lifetime a man gets to get this much money. You don't think I'm gonna give it up when I got it right here in my kit? No, not me. I'm gonna have one hell of a time for the rest of my life up in Canada and send my two boys to college. Do you imagine? You're gonna get away with the money, make a stand by and watch? That's just what you're gonna do. And I'm gonna have my man keep me here all night until I get a damn good start. Okay! Give me that money!
got to strike. Lord, I didn't think we'd find you alive. The only difference between me and a real live one is that I'm tired and hungry and half dead. Well, how'd you come out? Did you finish your book? Allow me. Thank you. 